Thank you all for coming and welcome. My name is Eric Paddock. I'm the curator of photography here at the Denver Art Museum. And I'm really happy that you're all here with us this morning. Uh, today's event, the lecture, is presented in conjunction with the dam's new photography exhibition, Fuzzle Shake, Thirst, Exposure, In Place, which is, will be on, is on view on the sixth floor of the Martin Building. That's opening today, and it will be up through Sunday, October 20th. That gives you plenty of time to think you're going to come back and see it for the sixth time and then forget all about it and wake up on October 21st and kick yourself. So uh, you can do that if you want. Um, but please do come back uh, to see the exhibition and enjoy it as often as you can. The exhibition and today's talk are presented through the very generous support of Jane P. Watkins, to whom we're deeply, deeply grateful. Jane texted this morning and said she's unable to make it to Denver today, but she's with us in spirit, and we look forward to walking through the exhibition with her someday soon. The exhibition is also supported by DAM's uh, contributors to the Art Museum's annual fund leadership campaign, and to all of you upstanding citizens who support the scientific and cultural facilities tax. So thanks for that. You can go shopping in the gift shop um, after the lecture, and then head up to the gallery to see the show. Uh, before I introduce Fuzzle, oh, there you are. All right. <laughs> Before I introduce Fuzzle Shake, I want to welcome our special guests whose contributions and collaboration add to the meaning and the beauty of the exhibition upstairs. Joni Yellowman, do you want to wave or stand up or anything? There you go. <laughs> Jonah is a Dine, or Navajo spiritual leader, and an advisor to Utah Dine Bikea, a coalition of indigenous nations who hold the Bears Ears sacred and seek to protect the region. Uh, I think Fuzzle will be talking a little more about that uh, when he speaks. Jonah brought us a really beautiful and special offering to, the, to Denver that's an important component of the exhibition. And yesterday, he gave a blessing to the museum, its collections, our community, and the land on which we live. We're very grateful for that, Jonah. Thank you. Jonah's, da Jonah's daughter, Trina Yellow Man, I stand up. <laughs> Trina created the uh, textile piece that is an element of the offering in the gallery, and it's really beautiful. I hope you enjoy seeing that. She's also created a salve. Is it? Can I do a shameless commercial plug here? I'm going to. Uh, she's uh, made a, a really wonderful salve from uh, tree sap that she's collected in the bear's ears and some other ingredients. Did you get the labels stuck on those jars last night? Okay. So those will be available in the museum shop uh, probably later today. If not, uh, come on back sometime soon and load up. Um, I also want to welcome Jeffrey Moore, whom I've not met. Please stand up. Thanks for coming, Jeffrey. <laughs> Jeffrey Moore is a geologist at the University of Utah whose, uh, whose sound recordings lend, a, I think, a powerful and very moving sound element to the in-place installation up on the sixth floor. I think Fuzzle will talk about that a little more, or you can visit with Jeffrey after, after the talk. The sound represents the heartbeat of the earth and instills a sense of awe to those who experience it. So thank you all very much. All right, are you ready? Okay, Fuzzle Shake, um, everybody. Fuzzle's recognized for his, uh, for his great compassion and his tremendous concern for refugees and for marginalized and displaced people across the earth. Some of you will recall that in 2017, we presented an extensive retrospective of that work in the gallery directly upstairs. That was called Common Ground. And I think it was one of the most kind of moving photography exhibitions that we presented here. Um, I've never seen so many people walking through the gallery with tears in their eyes. And we're grateful for that. And I think the people who experienced it are also grateful. 
Our new exhibition represents a shift in the form and the locale of Fossil's work. It's as humanitarian and important, I think, as, as any of the work that he's done. Thirst Exposure in Place focuses on places and people who are near at hand to those of us who live here in the West. The human and environmental costs of extractive industry, the effects of climate change, and the marginalization of indigenous people are matters that shape the way we live and the way we think here in Colorado and across the American West. Uh, we brought the exhibition here as a way of contributing to the conversation about those issues, and we're very proud to have it, and very grateful to Fuzzle for letting us borrow the work and for coming to speak today. Please, warm welcome for Fuzzle Shake. Thank you. Give me just a moment to hook this up. Eric, I must say, I mean, you mentioned the mid-career retrospective we did seven years ago, and for me that already in and of itself was such a heartening collaboration with the museum. It was so uh, full of gestures of generosity. And, you know, for an artist only to have something like that is really an extraordinary thing. And then for them to invite me back only a short seven years later is really quite extraordinary, and particularly to bring my friends with me. Um, several of whom have collaborated on this project, so are these projects. So I'll look forward to sharing a bit of that with you in a moment, as soon as I'm connected. May I ask to override that? Uh, before I, I start properly, I'd like to say, I'd like to ask that we take a moment to reflect upon the indigenous peoples, the nations of the Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Ute people upon whose lands the Denver Museum was founded. Along with many other people of <clears throat> indigenous nations that call this place home and who have lived and stewarded this land for generations, I'm grateful to Dakota Hoska, Associate Curator of Native Arts, for nurturing the early encounters with the eight-member Indigenous Advisory Council, which enabled an exchange in the service of collaboration and community with Joni Elliman and this work. In our recent conversation, Dakota shared with me the determination of the Denver Art Museum to cite the manners in which it has benefited from the displacement of indigenous peoples, as well as the removal and historical misrepresentation of their arts, which has resulted in irreparable harm to these very communities. I was heartened to learn of this commitment to indigenous peoples, and to know that the institution has initiated a mode of inclusivity. I also honor the members of Bears Ears Movement from the Hopi, Navajo, Owinta Ure Ute, Ute Mountain Ute, Zuni, and Puebloan communities, whose invitation to remain in residence, as well as their collaborative spirit and openness to these inquiries forms the heart of this exhibition. In particular, I'm grateful to you, Jonah, spiritual advisor and former board member of Utah Dine Bikea, the intertribal coalition which fought to establish and later to restore Bears Ears National Monument. I thank him for his friendship, for his counsel, and for conducting the blessing ceremony of protection and harmony as well as for his offering, which is at the center of the in-place exhibition. In these turbulent recent years, I've often considered what it means to be an artist um, in a world full of commerce. And it occurs to me that the role of the artist is to confront the substantive issues of our time in the hopes of nurturing a sense of community across the distance of race, gender, religion, and political striation in order to create work that fosters community and solidarity. It has been essential for me to draw upon the love and friendship of my partner, Alexandra Beck. I'm also grateful to Terry Tempest Williams, who can't be here this evening or this morning, and to Jeff Moore for their collaboration and generosity, as well as for the counsel and friendship of Emmett and Edith Gowan, Steve and Lynn Fitch, 
Jody Hauptman and Greg Clarick and Trina Yellowman, all of whom are in the audience today, as you know. And to the Denver Art Museum for the embrace which it has given this work and for believing that addressing the legacy of environmental racism and providing restorative justice are pivotal to its mandate. For nurturing this perspective, I thank the museum's director, Christoph Heinrich, the curator of photography, and my friend, Eric Paddock, as well as Kim Roberts, Eric Bergemeyer, and all the thoughtful installation crew who handled this work with such care. For her commitment to helping this work reach a wider audience, especially during times as fractious as these, and for her generosity of spirit and belief in the potential of art to engender conversation, I also want to thank Jane P. Watkins, without whom this work would not have been possible. What I'd like to do briefly now, I hope that I've got this right. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Very accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Those visiting artists are so wonderfully accomplished. Um, I'd just like to share with you a bit of the genesis of these three projects, so you have a kind of grounding um, for encountering the work upstairs. I hope that afterwards you might have the chance to actually stand in the space, because it's a very different experience of the work when one is enveloped in the space and the sort of particularly the harmonious uh, sanctity that is the space constructed in collaboration with Jonah and with Jeff. But um, by way of explanation, uh, I started on a project exposure in uh, 2017. And I had been invited at the time uh, to, to a fellowship at Dartmouth College, wherein I gave an a lecture about my previous five years' work. I'd been working in Israel and Palestine. And uh, although I won't speak uh, of that work uh, today because I think it's too, too divisive, too complicated, and too painful in many ways, um, there was an aspect of that work uh, entitled Desert Bloom, which interrogated the manner in which the southern Negev had been handled um, manipulated, transformed in the intervening years from the advent of the State of Israel until the time I was working there, 2015 to 2020. And the subtext of much of that work, it was in solidarity and collaboration with the Bedouin communities. The subtext of that work, much of it was about the notion of wastelanding. Wastelanding has is, is been posited by uh, Professor Voiles here in the States, and it suggests that within a desert expanse, all sorts of malevolent activity can, uh, can occur. This is an area uh, beyond great scrutiny, and it means that one can situate military installu installations there, toxic wa uh, waste excuse me, uh, repositories. And indeed, when thinking of those areas as disposable landscapes, is also the notion that the people who, who live in those spaces, who inhabit those lands, are they themselves expendable? And I think this kind of sinuous thread is a real corollary to what we see here in the American Southwest. That day of the lecture, Terry Tempest Williams, the writer from Utah, was in the audience. She was professor at Dartmouth at the time. And she pulled me aside after, after the lecture. We had many mutual friends, but we had never met before. And she said, could we have a meal together? And we met the following day. And she was so extraordinarily generous and so um, inviting she asked, would I consider coming back to Utah? She knew that I had been here soon after college. I spent several months uh, in the Four Corners area after my mother passed away. And it was a place that had borne me great, great solace and comfort in that time. But she said, would you come back and would you think about meeting with the elders of Utah Dine Bikeya? The five tribe intertribal coalition that was well, they had fought to, to win the right of Bears Ears National Monument, but it was just at a moment where the new administration was perhaps thinking of scouring those very lands. 
And I was, I must admit, I was really very hesitant, not for the sense of lack of interest, but for the fear that I perhaps didn't have the wherewithal to confront such a complex set of issues. Something in the back of my mind couldn't keep from some level of uh, interest and uh, inquiry. So I agreed actually to come a couple of months later. And I flew out to Castle Valley. I spent the night at their home, Brooke and, and Terry Williams. And the very next morning, we drove south the two and a half hours that would lead us to the town of Bluff in the, the southern corner of Utah. It was the day upon which they were having the annual general, general meeting of Utah Dinimbikea. And though I was aware it was to be with a group of elders from these five communities, I must say that in walking in that room, uh, witnessing these elders, Jonah amongst them, who was a board member at the time, was at once in, in just incredibly extraordinary to witness the elders from five different tribes, tribes which had not historically perhaps gotten along in the most harmonious fashion, but who had put their distances aside or their divisions aside in the interest of winning a, a space that was sacred for all of their communities. And I really recognized that moment as well as being a person of color myself, um, trying to navigate the different impulses within my own heritage, standing in a room with leaders of various communities alongside Terry, Terry Williams herself, born and raised in Utah of Mormon descent, um, and a woman who had written an extraordinary piece about um, cancer within her family as a result of living downwind of the test sites. So, incredibly, as you can imagine, intimidating scenario. But in the afternoon that day, they asked me to speak for myself, and I introduced myself, my heritage, where I came from, and gratitude for being invited to be at that meeting. In the wake of that, they suggested perhaps that I would remain on uh, as an artist in residence. I think it was the first artist in residence, which they've still carry on to this day. And it was extraordinary that they had kind of decided upon that so quickly. I, I returned soon thereafter. And um, my first mode was to think about a sort of primer about Bears ears to begin to understand the underpinnings of what the issues were. And I knew from my work in the Negev that it was important to think about the footprint of Bears ears, about the perimeter of that area. And when we think about the idea that the area may be soon curtailed, I wondered, you know, to myself, which areas are meant to be scoured away from this space and why? And I wanted to see that from an aerial perspective. This is an image of Mary Banali, Hopi Navajo board member at the time, who was there on that day. And Loretta Posey passed away two years ago. She was Ute. In the first days of my visits with the community, she would sit quietly next to her charge, Mary Jane Yazzie, who was also Ute. And they were working on, an, on a dictionary of the Ute language. But in those days, Mary Jane was the board member, and Loretta was just there to care for her, to attend to her during the meetings. In the wake of Mary Jane's own passing, Loretta ascended to the board. And she was an extraordinary force stalwart within that community, very understated. But when she spoke, she spoke with a poignancy and a directness that was exceptional to witness. In any case, I was grateful to be in the presence, as I said, of, of these elders. And now going back to that idea, this is Willie Gray Eyes, who was the chairman of the Utah Dinebikea in that time. It was, or it was 2017. Um, I began to, to see the borders of the, of the land from aloft, as I said, and to think about what was just on the edges of the original borders. Why were the borders set where they were? And when they started to talk about how they might be curtailed, what did that mean? Why this area to be carved out of the borders of the, of the National Monument? And I soon realized, actually, 
the same kinds of things, the same kind of malevolent activities were happening here that I had witnessed in the, in the Negev. The areas to be carved out corresponded entirely to a wish for extraction of uranium resources, oil and gas and coal. And so I decided that actually my best um, gesture in that moment would be to interrogate, to look in a very sort of detailed forensic sense at these very spaces and to try to bring that sort of veiled history more to light. One afternoon, several months into my uh, work there, there was another meeting and it was a meeting within which we were talking about clearly that Trump was going to come and he was going to scour what ended up to be, as you probably know, 85% of the footprint of Bears Ears. We thought, you know, what can the group do? You know, I was always demurred, demurred. I'd sat in the corner with Terry or on my own because, you know, my sense was w we answer the questions when we're asked. And it was for the elders, Jonah and those in the room, to decide the best trajectory. But the extraordinary thing was we were sitting at dinner that evening. Joan, I don't know if you remember that, but we were sitting with Jonah and Willie, and Willie just said, you know, this isn't a moment of division. This isn't a moment of aggression. We can write an open letter to Trump and tell him that he has the chance to provide healing. He has the chance to win the trust and enduring admiration of these communities who have suffered so long at the hands of the national government. We thought, oh, that's just brilliant. Coming from one of the elders, the chairman of the Utah Dini Bikea, it's obvious. That night and the next morning, uh, Terry helped with Jonah and Willie to draft this open letter to the president. And it was submitted to the New York Times, the LA Times, the Tribune, in every case, it was flatly refused. Terry, who writes for those periodicals on occasion, had never before received a rejection without any explanation as to why this piece was not to be reproduced, right? And there you had this most obvious rebuttal to the moments of, you know, political rancor in the time. So we thought that can't be. And we decided on our own just to make a very simple brochure. Was the, the work I was engaged in was called Exposure, a portion of which, as I said, is up in the galleries. But we made this brochure on our own. We gathered the resources together. We made thousands and thousands of copies. And we started to hand them out to grassroots organizations, at lectures, at the universities. I was teaching at Princeton at the time. Terry was at Harvard. And it was essentially a, a grassroots plea, which incorporated, this is just showing you, it's an unfolded version of the brochure, forgive me, but it had uh, writings by Terry about what it had meant to live as a downwinder and to grow up in that space. It had uh, Willie's letter, open letter to the president. Um, and it had several images with the interrogation of what those spaces of... Um, uh, extractive industry held, right? Uranium, as I said, oil and gas and coal. And it, for us, I think it was also, it's something that they used for many years. Uh, and it was just the idea that you had to feel as though you were doing something effective, or you had to feel that you, somehow you were engaged, even though you couldn't really uh, intuit what that means. You know, you couldn't calculate the, the tangible effect of that. The back of the poster, it's a large piece folded out to this piece from Mexican Hat, which when you see it uh, atop the landscape, you, you don't know quite what you're looking at. Um, it's actually uh, the, the uranium capsite at Mexican Hat, which is on the way between Bluff and Jonah and Trina's home in Monument Valley. And I'll say, when I show this, this image to to Jonah for the first time, who has lived his whole life in that area, he was stunned by what the rendering showed. And I think it's important with this work in particular to, to elucidate, to, to determine specifically what it is you're looking at. And I'm going um, to take a moment just to read one of the, the sort of forensic analyses of, of the sites, because I think that's important. It's not necessarily always needing to be present at, forth and, you know, at the forefront of the exhibition, but it is important to acknowledge that veiled history. 
So I'm just going to read you this short paragraph that describes what it is we're looking at. It's a Mexican hat, as I said. This image shows the capped site of a former uranium processing mill and a plant for manufacturing sulfuric acid containing 4.4 million tons of dry radioactive waste. Both facilities were constructed in the 1950s on land leased from the Navajo Nation. They were operative between 1957 and 1965. When the lease expired in 1970, the land, along with its mill structures and contaminated uranium tailings, a waste byproduct of mining, reverted to the Navajo Nation. The tailings had been left uncovered, resulting in the spread of toxic dust via wind and water erosion. In 1995, as part of the Department of Energy's Uranium Mill Tailings Remediation Act project, a further 1.3 million tons of hazardous waste and uranium tailings were placed on the site. The disposal cell was then capped using a radon barrier 24 inches thick, followed by a 20-inch layer of coarse-hewn rock or riprap. The cell covers an area of nearly 68 acres adjacent to the village of Halchita, where 98% of the population is Native American. A marker, the white spot, barely visible uh, in the center of the image, reads, Date of closure, July 20th, 1994. Dry tons of tailings, 4.4 million. Radioactivity, 1,800 1, curies, RA-226. This piece is uh, just an image of the, the gathering just before Trump's arrival, uh, sort of protest at the state capitol in Salt Lake City, wherein they, they handed out the brochures and in the hopes, perhaps, that Trump wouldn't actually curtail the, the footprint of the monument. As you know, he did. He came and he stripped it of 85%. It's also important for me when thinking about the portraits to work in an incredibly collaborative framework to, to step back and to hopefully enable both the gaze and the testimony of the person that sits before me. And I asked uh, Jonah yesterday or day before if it would be okay to read Lola's testimony, which comprises actually part of the exhibition. I would like to read this one because I think it also, it really uh, speaks about the way in which it's so deeply um, woven within the community. Um, as you probably know, uh, native, natives were often asked to be miners working uh, in the mines during the nuclear extractive industry complex. And they were never really told what it was they were being subjected to, which I find extraordinary. In any case, this is in Lola's voice. I was born in 1940 near Mexican Hat, in the area where the Vanadium Corporation of America had a uranium mine. My father's uncle, Luke Yazzi, used to take uranium ore over to Goulding's, a trading post in the Monument Valley. My father was also picking up those rocks to load them onto trucks to earn some money. The medicine men told our men not to work in the mines, that it was dangerous. But the men needed to support their families and had no choice. Besides, they were told by those who were buying the ore that they were helping their country. We lived beside the mine shaft where the men were blasting the rock with explosives. During one of those blasts, my father was knocked unconscious and had to be dragged out of the shaft. Eventually, as the mine dust was blanketing the place and the sheep were covered in that dust, we decided to move to the south side of the mesa, and my father rode his horse to the mine each day. Having worked in the mines for many years, my father was laid low by respiratory illness. And after repeated stays in the hospital with doctors not knowing what was happening to him, he passed away in 1971. His life ended early. My husband, uh, my husband John Guy, worked in the mines like my father. As John started to get more responsibility in the mine, they wanted us to move back near the mine shaft and the tailings piles. He would arrive home during his lunch break with his clothes caked in uranium dust, and I cleaned those clothes in our home every day. 
The children played on the tailings pile, but no one from the company ever told us the dangers they were being exposed to, or even offered the workers any protective equipment inside the mine. Eventually, my husband was made a foreman at the mine, and he worked there until it closed. The company moved on, leaving behind the tailings and telling us that we could use the material, which many members of our tribe took to build the foundations of our homes. In 1992, after the mine was closed, John was part of the team that created the Uranium Mill, Mill Tailings Remediation Act site, the permanent disposal site you've just seen at Mexican Hat. It's near where I was born and brought the remains of the mill buildings there to bury them along with the schoolhouse nearby. By that time, John had become a spiritual leader and roadman in our community. And when he was taken ill, we had many ceremonies done for him to try and heal him. Nothing ever worked, and he eventually passed away in 2001 in the hospital in Tuba City. In terms of uranium, this is the site in New Mexico called Church Rock, which in fact is the second greatest breach of radioactive material in world history, second only, by the way, to Chernobyl. Larger than, larger than that which uh, was released at Three Mile Island in the same year of 1979. I came to understand Church Rock. It was a place that I didn't know well, uh, but I was working with uh, Navajo geoscientist Tommy Rock, who we were actually able to bring to Princeton for two days. And his main area of study was not just Church Rock, Church Rock but it was downriver, all the way in Sanders, Arizona. And he was following the radioactivity in recent years as it has migrated through the waterways down from Church Rock all the way into his community in Sanders. Tom Atin, who worked his whole life in the uranium mines as a blaster. Oljato in the Monument Valley. Tuba City in northern Arizona. This is an extraordinary thing. One of the, the parents of the school, Lena Fowler, noticed that all the children, and so many of them were coming down with odd illnesses, and she was insistent that it had something to do with the mill that was nearby. Of course, all the company heads said it had absolutely nothing to do with that. But over time, they were able to prove, the mothers of the PTA were able to prove, in fact, that through the EPA that the illness had come from this site. And they were able also to insist upon the capping of that site, which was quite an extraordinary sort of advocacy moment from within the community, which is something that I'm always very cognizant of, is that the communities that have been impacted, they're also enormously not only resilient, but capable of uh, being resourceful in the way that they combat these issues. In the wake of the companies uh, having created the, the cap site and moved on, they discovered actually that the shepherds in the nearby area who were shepherding across their herds across the highway found an area that had been denuded for years and they complained to the local community elders. Turned out under cover of night that oil drums um, filled with the material from inside the waste site had been buried across in this outreach area. And it was beyond the mandate then of the EPA or of the company to come, excuse me, the company to come back and continue the remediation work. Similarly, in many instances, you can see just the tip of the cap site uh, on the upper left-hand corner of the image. Navajo communities are moving back within a very close um, um, footprint of, of the cap site itself, which is extremely hazardous for them. Ambrosia Lake, all of these areas uh, near Church Rock in, in central New Mexico were at the, at the center of the nuclear industrial complex in the 50s. But what's extraordinary to me realize, I mean, this is the Jack Pile Mine. It's an open strip mine, which is in close striking distance to a small community called Paguate. And all of the erosion, all the erosion through wind, air, uh, rain and groundwater is still just running off those piles today.
Another facet of the inquiry was to look at oil and gas. And this is an image from the Uinta Range. As you may know, some of the community there um, are in working in concert with the oil companies, but it is uh, an inhospitable, rather uh, desolate terrain. And quite an extraordinary thing happened several years ago. A Mormon midwife uh, who had worked for 50 years in her own community, Donna Young, brought to their attention the fact that there were many birth defects being registered or stillborn births that she had never seen in the early years of her functioning as a midwife. Um, in that community, she was shunned, and she was, she was issued death threats. But she consistently stood by um, the determination that these evaporation ponds and the open uh, swath of fracking sites that had gone without remediation was impacting her own Mormon community. And of course, what we realize in the southern sweep of Anath, uh, excuse me, of Utah in particular, in Anath and Montezuma Creek, there's, there are large installations of fracking, fracking and large oil company actions. I met one day uh, Norman Sam, who's, who's uh, on the screen now. Norman was in his 80s, and he'd been a shepherd since childhood. His whole life, nearly 80 years, every day he was out with his flock in the village areas, in the areas beyond the village in his homestead. When he was a child, he told me, he took me up the canyon where he grew up. He said when the, when the oil companies first came in the 40s and 50s, they were the only families that were living there. And within a few months of the arrival of the oil companies, so intense were the fumes from the facilities that they actually had to move to the adjacent canyon pick up their homestead and move across to another canyon. When I met him, he was telling me about the facility right near his home. And it was a moment that I was working in concert with a group of scientists at Princeton. We sort of believed in the idea of collaborative justice. We were working with Tommy Rock, who was Navajo. He was part of the Princeton team. And we worked with methane experts and others who were uh, astute in the, in the study of methane and groundwater. And I worked also with a young gentleman named Luke Fitch, whose parents are here today, uh, who had a drone company. And we fixed to the drone a FLIR camera, which enables one to see uh, that which is invisible to the naked eye. It enables one to see the plumes of methane as they come aloft from the various installations. I'm just going to show you a short clip of the, of the video we made. It has some audio which Jeff Moore very kindly uh, gathered together for us. And it's just to give you a little bit of a sense of the severity of what is actually happening beyond the naked eye in these spaces. Travis, if you wouldn't mind putting that on just for a minute. Please look to the second uh, image from the left and the top. I suggested that image on the, the second one in from the left, uh, second from the top, because uh, Norman lived about 150 yards away from this facility. And he kept saying that there was a problem with that facility. He said he went to the management of the facility and he was saying there's really something wrong. And they repeatedly refused to admit that there was any problem. Turns out what we were able to see right here in one instance was a large fissure on the top of one of these holding tanks. And so the methane would creep out of the tank, down underneath the pressure of the air, and along the ground to his home and to others. He's the only member in his 80s of his family still living. Ironically enough, he's the one who was always the closest in contact with these facilities. And we thought, as the scientists, we thought, wow, you know, this is incredible. We're going to show this to him, and he's just going to be astonished. We showed it to him, and he unflinchingly just said, yeah. It was as though he knew that already. There was no need to see some sort of scientific proof. It was just clear. If we needed some sort of scientific rigor to understand the severity, that was for us. 
And that's something I've witnessed time and again in the community. It's a kind of, I don't know, Joan has often done that with me as well. It's a kind of like a deep clarity and a really unimpressed notion. I can't tell you the number of times I've, lacked, uh, I've failed to impress Jonah, where he just says, yeah, well, what are you talking about? Of course, you know, and, but we then, then we, we did a curious thing. We fixed this drone uh, with a, we put, fixed, excuse me, a camera on this drone and you could fly close to the plumes. And what the scientists at Princeton are now trying to do is they're trying to um, put the sensor along with the camera on the drone so that you could fly into the plume and methane in and of itself is not the carcinogen, if I'm not mistaken, Jeff, sorry. But you have to then try and um, extract or determine what is the benzene, what are the carcinogen qualities within that plume that could prove that it is hazardous for the communities, right? And so this is uh, something that hasn't been done before, but they're actually working on that in a pretty innovative fashion. This is further afield. This is a work I've, I've done in uh, Oildale, the first set of um, oil fracking installations north of Bakersfield in California. It's a nine by nine mile swath of just this extraordinarily apocalyptic landscape. And for those who live in Bakersfield as well, many of who are, whom are not native, most of whom are not native, but yet many of whom are somewhat impoverished, they have also little awareness of the severity that is on their doorstep, right? Coal was a, fire, a further facet. Um, many of the coal mines, one of the biggest one, Black Mesa, was closed down recently. And we, you know, it was seen as this incredible coup. But I think um, this is the Segundo mine in southern, southern Mexico, uh, excuse me, southern New Mexico. Um, many of the mines are being shut down now. Here's Jack Cly, a miner of, uh, for his whole life in the coal mines. But we don't also then realize or quantify the impact upon the communities, right? If you have one member of your family who's sustaining the whole family by working in that mine, what, how, how do we wish to enable their you know, forward progress to support their homes, support their livelihoods? livelihoods excuse me. That's a copper mine uh, in Silver Bell Copper Mine in, in northern Arizona. Fort Wingate Munitions Repository was actually the site uh, of the Long March where they had gathered the Native American communities. This, ironically enough, is the uh, remains of the footprint of the topaz internment camp for Japanese refugees. Uh, which is near Delta, Utah. What an ironic thing that you were taking people from the northwest coast, moving them to this desert expanse, and they were then going to live in a place where uranium was being gathered to create the weapons that would be dro dropped on their family members in Japan. Kind of extraordinary. The beryllium mine, which is close on to the heels of, of that camp in, in Delta, Utah. and the Clive Waste site, which is actually within a, what could potentially someday be a, a floodplain of, of the Great Salt Lake. I'll speak briefly, and this is a little bit out of step because it runs the sweep from 2018 until last year, but I speak a little bit about thirst. Um, thirst is specific to, to Great Salt Lake, and when I was looking at these extractive industry sites, I first went around the perimeter of the lake and I was interested in those industries that had really great incursions upon the land. This one is from MagCorp, um, which was touted to be emitting 90% of the nation's chlorine for many years. In the 90s, a small grassroot, uh, grassroots organization, uh, a book written by Chip Ward, um, called Canaries on the Rim, were able to prevail on the government to look very closely at this, this space. It's a very forbidding installation near Raleigh, Utah, right on the edge of the lake. And they decided, they determined it was a Superfund site. The area was owned by Ira Rennert, a billionaire. And in the wake of that determination that it was a Superfund site, the bank, the, excuse me, the company simply went bankrupt. They, they 
narrowed their footprint, and then they renamed themselves U.S. MagCorp, still functioning today. The argument is that they have l lower emissions, but as Jeff Moore will tell you, it's an area that is uh, incredibly cloistered. It is secreted away in, a, in an expanse near the military installations that is virtually inaccessible. And you really can only see it from the air when you fly over it, the severity and the way in which these effluents, this is right on the edge of the lake of Great Salt Lake, these effluents are making their way right into the lake bed. Although in 2018, 19, I was looking in more kind of clear way at what is it you want to see forensically. This is the, the causeway that was built in the early 20th century, which bisects the lake, severing the northern arm, which has no tributaries, from the southern arm. The southern arm has three main rivers, the Bear, the Weber, uh, that come into it and feed this, this. It is a terminal lake, but it at least has... Uh, water coming into it. The northern arm, which was uh, was severed initially just by a railway trestle, allowing water to come and go. In the late 50s, that whole area was made as it as you see it here. It was essentially sealed. There are a few small areas where it has uh, within the causeway a kind of uh, means by which the water can make its way through. Here you see the bottom of the image is the northern aspect of the lake and the top is the southern. And I looked at this for a couple of years and was confounded. And then in 2022, um, I traveled with Terry Tempest Williams. Um, it turned out that both of us had spent time at the lake in 1970, excuse me, 87, was the time that my mother has, had passed away and I, I found a great deal of solace in the Four Corners area. And I moved often around the lake bed. Uh, and so Terry and I spent about five or six days also uh, circumambulating the lake. We didn't walk the whole way. We, we would drive, and then we would sp spend the day walking and then come back together and sort of compare notes. Um, in the wake of that journey, she went back to Harvard to teach. And I, I remained because I wanted to see those spaces from an aerial perspective again. I hadn't photographed when we were on the ground. <laughs> Time's up. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, in any case, what I was most interested in and what latterly became the case was November 2022 was the lowest ebb, historical ebb, as you probably know, of Great Salt Lake. And it was a moment when the scientists were saying it was beyond recovery. And what I saw when I finally flew aloft around the lake was the kind of corporeal body in the midst of its death throes. And though you can't always determine exactly what it is you're looking at, you know that it's a space that is under great duress, right? And it starts, the book itself is also a physical piece which is more experiential than it is uh, determinate in terms of text. This starts with the dwindling um, tributaries coming into the lake in the southern arm. And you can see at the upper left point portion are the microbiolites. These would be the sort of ecosystem coral-like, let's call them, if Jeff doesn't get upset, underneath the surface of the water that sustain great life forms. But now they're drying and they're coming above the water, water line. When they dry further, they can't sustain any longer. They can't be, let us say, reanimated. Here you can see the sort of rugged portion on the lower is the microbiolite still underwater, so they're still somehow thriving, whereas the middle of the image shows you that they're sort of in their death throes. Here again, the microbiolites now unable to sustain life. And in the northern aspect, the salinity had increased to such a level, that's what they said was going to be... Uh, it would, would mean the death of the lake and the organisms that actually provide the sustenance for the millions of birds that migrate across that distance every year and the northern and southern trajectory. The northern aspect of the lake was the one that was experiencing most of this sort of bloodletting. This is the Barron's Trench, if you can me imagine. It's uh, connecting the holding ponds on the western aspect of the lake, 20 miles 
across the distance to the other holding ponds on the, on the eastern side of the lake. And the deep red is because the hypersalinity of that water means that its weight brings it to the bottom of the trench. And there's a trench is just enough of an angle so that it can migrate across. I think it takes four or five days, if I'm not mistaken, to, to traverse the distance of that 20 miles from the western portion to the eastern portion. But to me, it just seemed like such an incredible aggression upon the landscape. At the moment, per perplexingly, uh, scientists are talking about the fact of severing the northern part of the lake may actually be, have been a good thing, that it may actually help us sustain the life of the southern part of the lake. And I was talking with Jeff last night. I said, how can that be? You're a scientist. You need to explain this to me. And um, he said something that was really extraordinary to me was that if, if the water in the northern part were to completely evaporate, we know that the the sedentary areas, the silt at the base is extremely toxic. When born off, they're worried about Salt Lake City. But Jeff was suggesting, and I know that this is not proven, so I'm sorry, he's a scientist, he won't, he won't like that. But um, that the, if it's going off the northern aspect of the lake, it's going again to low-use communities. The same way in which the nuclear test site was imagined as okay, as long as you were only conducting the tests when they were going to the northeast, in other words, away from Las Vegas. So that whole, that, that whole, that whole, sorry, I'm given a time warning. It's the two-minute warning. <laughs> touchdown. Uh, that, that whole, <laughs> I'll try for a touchdown. Um, that whole idea that we didn't learn about not subjecting, you know, lower income communities or small communities to severe hardship doesn't mean native communities only, um, but it does mean that we should be cognizant of all the people that are impacted by these kinds of things. Here again, the north where you see the microbiolites are now um, dead on the atop the water and the hypersalinity has turned the water this deep red. So the microbiolites again now on top of the lake. So in a way, it's a kind of a, the book itself or the exhibition, not, not so much here because it's a very distilled set of images, but it seems to me that while now there's some wonderful grassroots organizations confronting this issue of the lake and, and maintaining it, um, it's also important to remain aware of what it looked like in its lowest moment. Hopefully it won't go beyond that again. But the life for me or the experience of it in that time was quite extraordinary. Um, I want to speak to you about this one last piece and I will uh, actually make it in time, miraculously. Um, I was asked by the MacArthur Foundation several years ago to participate in an exhibition um, for its 40th anniversary in Chicago. They'd asked about 20 artists from the 40 years of their grant making um, to posit something about social activism and, and change. And at the time I thought, oh, you know, this is going to be 2021, I'll share something of exposure with them. And then the pandemic hit. And I was in Switzerland mercifully and very luck luckily with my dear Alexandra and we were, you know, for more than a year basically sequestered in our home. And across the distance was Jonah and Trina and all the friends that had, you know, nurtured us and offered us hospitality over many years. Um, the Yellowman family, as many uh, of the members of the Navajo community, uh, suffered great sadness and loss. And to be separated from your friends and not able to offer them succor during a moment like that is really dreadful. But I talked to Jonah during that time and I said, well, I've got this invitation, but you know, it just doesn't seem like admonishing people about this sort of severity is the right thing in this time. And we need something that's about healing. We need something that's about generosity and solace. And he said, yeah, let's, let's think on that. 
Um, that's the in- enormously frustrating thing about Jonah is they, yeah, we're going to think about that. No, what's the answer, Jonah? No, you're going to think about that. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that um, he thinks about these things and then you come back together and he just pierces it right to the heart. And he said, you know, no, we agreed we needed to make a place of solace and contemplation and um, repair. And so I said this to the curator in Chicago. I said, no, actually, we'd rather not do that. We'd rather change the, the premise of the show. I, I don't feel comfortable with the egocentrism of being an artist in these times. I feel much more comfortable with a collaborative practice. And so Jonah and Jeff and I, we each constructed our own contribution to this exhibition entitled In Place. And it's about this restoration. It's about Um, sacred lands. It's about the gesture of just pure beauty. Walking in beauty, sitting in that space, the sonorous reverberations of that which is incredibly, in my estimation, atavistic. And I asked Jonah, you know, what what will be, what would you like to do? This is what I could imagine. And we went back and forth with what each of us would would offer. And he said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to make a blessing. And I want to put an offering in the space, right? And I said, okay, well, what, you know, what will that look like? And over time, we discussed, and then we came up with this idea of the immersive encounter of this space. Excuse me. And then we came, or I came more fully upon the work of, of Jeff Moore, who heads a, a, an organization at the University of Utah where he's professor of geosciences called the Geohazards Research Group. And I'd met them in, in Castle Valley with Terry um, before that time, and it was just so extraordinary what they were doing. They were, they were measuring um, the resonance, the fragility of, of arches and natural landforms, and they were using seismometric readings Ascending, scaling these spaces, the space we were in at the moment was a rec- listening to a recording of, of uh, Castleton Tower. And through these renderings that were speeded up then um, to make them aud- audible to, to the human ear, there was this sense of just the heartbeat of the land. It was, it was to take your breath away. Take your breath away. And... We met at at Terry Smith. There were five or six of his team there. They were in the midst, as I said, of making other recordings. And we were just so elated to spend time with them. And I latterly was so delighted that that Jeff was keen on collaborating further. And I'll say just before I I show you this last moment with the audio, you know, I I showed, I I met with Jonah and Terry down in Bluff again. And we put the headphones on, on Jonah and he listened to the heartbeat of Castleton Tower, and he listened. He was looking out across the landscape. He listened quietly, not saying anything. A few minutes later, he took off the headset, and he said, yep. It was again that idea, like, well, yeah, but I I know that. And it's sort of just the most uh, humbling and empowering thing to see. Again, like I mentioned before with Norman Sam, they're like, yep, well, you need that to make your own recordings, but I understand it already, you know? And I'll just tell you one more anecdote before I I play you a bit, because I think it's a very delightful thing about the nature of collaboration, because Jeff and his team were asked by the Six Tribe Intercoalition, I think, uh, on Native lands to have a look at Rainbow Bridge, right? An arch that is... um, essential to so many tribes and it was the it was the, the local communities the native communities asking jeff and his team to come and try and determine whether or not the flights that were coming by in particular i believe helicopters that were coming within close proximity of the arch if they were threatening the integrity of the arch itself right were the fissures was it going to create fissures in the arch would it perhaps collapse the sacred space I'm probably making the wrong sort of assumptions and and synopses, but it just struck me as such an extraordinary thing that the Native communities and the locals, you know, the scientists in Salt Lake could work hand in hand, which is something that I think is so essential in this time. And in fact, 
Jeff's team, they determined that the hertz was 30 hertz of the, the natural heartbeat, let's say, of the, of the arch itself was in direct relation to the, the, the level of the helicopter itself. Is that correct, Jeff? So these two working in concert together would, would severely impact and threaten the integrity of the arch itself. So through this science, they were actually able to impose restrictions upon flights near the arch. And even more beautifully, they determined that three months that, that, that the arch needed to rest, that there would be no flights near the arch for a period of three months. I think it was maybe even three months every year and that helicopters could not come in close proximity. Just the most beautiful thing of a collaboration. Anyway, I want to share just this, in this last, let's say, minute and a half, uh, you don't have to listen to me, it's just Jeff's recording of the heartbeat of the land, and we'll, we'll end with that. Turn that on, Travis, please. One final anecdote. Um, yesterday morning, Joan and I walked over. It was sort of, you know, sleet, gray morning, kind of oppressive and chilly. And Eric met us near the entrance at the back of the museum to bring us in because we looked like interlopers and probably threatening to the museum. Um, and he just turned to us. We were walking behind him. He said, oh, you know, I was coming in this morning, and there was a bald eagle perched up in the tree above the field out behind my house. And then Joan was walking by my side. He said, oh, that's a good open. That's a good open. The next hour, we went up into the gallery, and Jonah offered this extraordinarily beautiful blessing of the space. It's a protection of the space, but also of the museum and of us. And he calls it home, right? Protection of, of us and, of, and the sense that Somehow we've come home to a space that is unassailable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Fuzzle. Thank you all very much. Uh, we do have a few minutes for some questions. Uh, we're recording these talks so that we can share them with others who aren't able to join us today. So if you do have a question, raise your hand. And either Kim or I will bring a microphone up, pass it down the aisle. You can ask the question, and Fuzzle will, I don't know if he'll answer the question, but he'll respond to the question. And we have time for just a few, depending upon the lengths of the answers. All right? Thank you very much.
Yes, oh, sorry. Hi. Could you speak Hello. to the, the equipment you used and the drones and the, what was up front or close and what was far away in terms of the photography? Um, I rather liked in the sense of in place that you don't necessarily know the scale and the distance. Um, you experience that maybe more in the installation that you're a little bit in an uneasy sort of perspective. Um, I, I must admit that the technical things I'm not very adept with. Uh, I had the gift of this friend, as I said, Luke Fitch, who was, he's very gifted with drones, and we would discuss, you know, in a kind of maniacal precision, the way in which we're going, we're going to address different places. Um, and in terms of, you know, cameras and things like that, I just think we learn to use the necessary means to get what it is we want to see. And I would not in any way see myself as um, full of great knowledge about technical abilities. I'm pretty good at the things I want to do or need to do. And I think that's a good way of learning. Like, what is it I need to see? And, you know, the technical part is a kind of deviation that we, particularly with photography, you can get really off track with that somehow. Yes. Kim, I think she wants. Uh, this is to Jeff. How, how did you get the sounds? How did you record those? Um, so, uh, um, yeah, thanks for that question. We, we use seismometers to uh, measure vibration. And we speed vibration recordings up by a certain degree. So most of the natural landforms that, that you heard there have resonance frequencies that are infrasonic. So typically between like one and 10 hertz. And so these features are always resonating, always vibrating, but humans can't experience that. Naturally can't see it, hear it, feel it. So we take these vibration recordings and speed them up and say we just do it 10 or 20 times and it just translates all those frequencies very faithfully to the recording by that amount. And that brings it into the realm of human hearing and human experiences. So that's, that's what you hear. It's a vibration recording turned into sound. Just like I said. No. <laughs> 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 Brilliant. Thanks, <laughs> Time for one more question. Thank you so much for that wonderful and insightful presentation. Okay. It's very stimulating. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to ask this question, but I'll try. In your mind, in your experience, as we as a society of civilization pursue a technological life, do you have any thoughts about how we do that in sensitivity, in concert to our natural systems to live in, in concert with it? Do you have any, any thoughts about that at all? <laughs> I, I don't want to put Jonah on the spot, but Jonah's the guy, I think, to answer that question. You know, he said, no. Well, okay. He said, Jonah's very wise. I mean, he, the greatest of his wisdom was to say, no, no, I'm not going up there. You go. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> he did his thing yesterday. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll make a synopsis. I mean, it's an interesting thing. It's a, it's a phenomenal question because when I was at Princeton, we were thinking of working across the humanities and the sciences. You know, that's a big thing now at the university. It's usually a kind of failed endeavor because so many, so many people get hunkered on, down in their own niches and they're not generous with one another. But it can also be uh, extremely generative. And I think when we had Tommy there, you know, Tommy was, as I said, from Monument Valley, very active within his community, a, a community that's been blighted by uranium. And he does a lot of public outreach. We did a wonderful water project, getting potable water to members in the community. But what I wanted to say, and I think this is where I mentioned Jonah, is, and forgive me, I get this maybe a little bit wrong, Jonah, but, you know, you would, he might say, we understand the idea of the science and we need to use the science to mitigate, to offer restorative justice, to heal. But I've seen for myself the way in which Jonah goes into ceremony and the way in which 
um, one turns to traditional knowledge and traditional practices to to mitigate and also to provide like the most profound healing. And I think that's the thing that I really marvel at. I don't know if we did it wonderfully, but I've witnessed it in an extraordinary way. Like, okay, you can have, um, you know, traditional medicine, not, I mean, uh, let's say school medicine, excuse me, that confuses the issue. But what about the idea of deep traditional understanding, practice, and insight? And for me, that would be an enormous step forward, is if these universities could think, actually, we don't need to just value the geosciences and the like. We need to listen to traditional healers. This is not working. We need to listen to those people who have lived on these lands through millennia. Jonah will tell me, and many times he says, you know, we're here, we've been here, right? And they should be listening to us. So this, for me, is the, is the real important message and the idea that you prefer a kind of conversation, but then maybe you also inaugurate a space wherein traditional healers and the repositories of traditional practice are, are also having, as they say, a seat at the table, right? Also, thank you. Thank you all for listening. Thank you.